Before engaging in a physical workout, most of us will perform some kind of warm-up. We know this is important to improve performance and prevent injury, and yet we rarely ever consider the same approach for the brain. We sit down at the computer, stare at the blank page and wonder why words aren't just flowing. Or we go to answer emails and wonder why we can't stop checking Facebook. Never mind that we've literally just sat down after a stressful commute, playing with the kids or perhaps scrolling the news. Warm-ups for the brain can be just as effective at encouraging maximum performance and they may be precisely the missing ingredient you need to enjoy greater productivity and discipline. There's ample evidence to suggest that warming up the brain can be effective at improving subsequent performance. In one study, it was found that a 5-minute brain training game used before maths or reading exercises could improve outcomes. This follows from many other studies looking at priming. For instance, maths exercises can aid language tasks when used immediately prior, exposure to specific words can improve the ability to generate, recognise or classify related terms, and other more unusual examples exist too. For instance, reading an essay that contains the word I rather than the word we can actually improve reaction times. This is often referred to as priming, however priming can be used more broadly to refer to activities such as listening to music to impose a positive mood. Indeed, these can be effective measures too. One of my favourite videos discussing focus and flow comes from the channel Better Ideas. Joey suggests that all the flow hacks and tricks in the world usually won't trump a simple fact. Getting into a flow state takes time and sustained effort. Why might this be? Simple, the brain needs warming up. But what if instead of banging your head against a wall for 20 minutes, this is how long Joey suggests the concentration hump might last, you could instead perform a simple warm up. Complex training is an approach to strength training that seeks to prime the muscle for greater force production via post-activation potentiation. This means that the neural pathways involved in particular movements will be primed to activate again more easily. This effect is why 100kg feels really light after you've just been pressing 140kg. And it's why a coach might get an athlete to perform a conditioning activity prior to training and expect to see greater overall expression of strength. As you likely know already, the brain is brought to life by electrical activity that travels between a huge network of brain cells, sometimes called a connectome. Each synapse is a connection between neurons and can be thought of as a node in the network. When a neuron receives enough electrical stimulation from its inputs, the presynaptic neurons, it will continue the chain by passing on that charge. This firing impulse is known as an action potential. In order for an action potential to be triggered in a given brain cell, which is how neurons communicate, it must first reach the threshold potential. This is somewhere between minus 50 and minus 55 millivolts, whereas the typical resting potential is around minus 70 millivolts. In skeletal muscle, an increase in myosin light chain phosphorylation in type 2 muscle fibres results in muscle cells becoming more excitable and thus more readily able to contract. This excitability remains elevated with a half-life of approximately 28 milliseconds. But what's really interesting is that we see continued improvement in performance for minutes after the event. This is sometimes described as post-activation performance enhancement, and it's the result of several other factors. Blood supply to the muscle, alterations in muscle temperature, muscle cellular water content, etc. And this is why a conditioning activity can be effective several minutes prior to the main exercise. Similar effects may be at play in the brain. Following activation of specific brain regions, we see an increased blood flow to those regions thereby increasing available energy. Moreover though, we'll also see alterations in the excitability of neurons, modulated via neurotransmitters, and this is where things get really interesting. This is short-term plasticity, or dynamical synapses. Two key processes in short-term plasticity are enhancement and depression, also known as fatigue. These processes increase or decrease the likelihood of activation, respectively, and can occur within milliseconds. As most of you will know, neurons do not only communicate via electricity, rather they also rely on chemicals called neurotransmitters. You will recognise many of these, such as the feel-good serotonin and the goal-directing dopamine. These chemicals exert their effects primarily by increasing or decreasing the excitability of neurons. Inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA and serotonin make neurons less likely to fire, whereas excitatory neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and dopamine and acetylcholine have the opposite effect. Pop science tends to imply that our brain is full of one chemical or another at a given time. If you're happy, it's because your brain is flooded with serotonin. 
Rather though, these chemicals often act in a far more localised fashion. At the scale of brain regions and even specific connections, this is one reason taking a pill to increase dopamine is not the smart fix we might assume it to be. Short term synaptic facilitation, a form of synaptic enhancement, results from an increased likelihood of presynaptic neurons, the inputs, releasing neurotransmitters due to any previous activity, and more specifically this is due to increased presynaptic calcium concentration. Because more neurotransmitters are being released, synapses will strengthen for a short time, resulting in increased excitatory postsynaptic potential. Hence a maths warm-up will prime you to subsequently solve difficult maths problems. Conversely, synaptic depression or fatigue occurs when the readily available neurotransmitter vesicles become depleted. Vesicles are like sacs which hold the neurotransmitters by the way. This makes those synapses less likely to activate. And these processes do not occur exclusively, but rather concurrently. And it's thought that these adaptation processes help to prime us to process important new information. For example, synaptic depression may help us to focus more greatly on novel stimuli. And it's easy to see how synaptic facilitation could result in greater focus after a short period of effort, or heightened ability to recall specific information after previously retrieving it. Synaptic enhancement can be divided into subtypes, facilitation, augmentation, and potentiation. These classifications represent the duration of the effect, with facilitation lasting only a few milliseconds, whereas augmentation lasts for seconds. Potentiation, post-tetanic potentiation, can last for minutes. And if you consider how signals spread and propagate throughout a brain region, the lingering effect could be cumulatively significantly longer. If you think of your connectome as a complex network of roads, then these adaptation processes act like diversions, rerouting traffic through those existing structures and potentially resulting in entirely different outcomes. Over time, this may also lead to permanent structural changes, as the increased likelihood of specific patterns of activation result inevitably in their becoming reinforced via long-term potentiation. Computer models of neuroplasticity reveal short-term plasticity to have profound effects over time. Synaptic facilitation has even been used as the proposed neural mechanism of working memory. This may be what allows us to maintain and manipulate information in the mind's eye, although I should mention that this is just one possible explanation. I also wonder whether this could go some way to explaining the Zygarnik effect too. This is the effect that allows a waiter to recall multiple customers' orders, only to fail to even recognise them after their shift is over. Information that is in active use is more easily accessed. Neurogenesis and gliogenesis, the birth of new brain cells, occur over the course of days, which has led many to presume that permanent structural change requires a similar time period. But there is ample evidence to suggest that morphological changes, such as the formation of entirely new synapses, could occur much more quickly. In one study, structural changes that amounted to variations in the density of brain tissue were observed in the brains of participants using DTI following 90 to 120 minutes of a spatial learning task. Think about this for a minute. As you learn and play, your brain is literally growing and reshaping like a time lapse of a tree. To me, this seems highly intuitive. After all, I've made no attempt to recall what I had for breakfast, and yet I can do so with ease. I'll likely still remember this in a few days. Facilitation doesn't explain this as it happened hours ago. Thus, I suspect that structural plasticity can occur in an even shorter timescale, and that means priming your brain could actually change the roads themselves ready for action, as well as the flow of traffic. The initial likelihood of vesicles releasing neurotransmitters varies from neuron to neuron, and this essentially allows certain neurons to act like filters. Some neurons we want to fire easily, some we want to be more difficult to activate. So the brain is super complex in other words. And this is to say that attempting to boost your cognitive performance by taking stimulants is like trying to tune a radio with a hammer. This is not the key to better focus and creativity. This could also present issues for those hoping to use transcranial direct current stimulation. We don't want to make every connection in the brain more prone to firing, not even within a single brain region. But priming and warming up the brain? Well that might be much more effective because we can use exercises that exactly mimic what we want to be doing. So with all that said, how could you go about warming up the brain and priming it for action? We could start with some broader systemic approaches. Full body exercise will help to stimulate blood flow around the body and that will include the brain. Listening to music that improves your mood could also be helpful. If you're in a funk and can't focus, the right music could alter your hormonal cocktail. As many hormones also act like neurotransmitters, this could also get you in the right state of mind. But the secret weapon may well be to use a cognitive conditioning activity. 
So if you need to write an essay, you could spend a few minutes writing something else to start priming the right networks for action, rather than just finding yourself procrastinating and putting it off because you can't engage with the task. Likewise, if you need to focus on a dull work task, then doing the simplest parts of your job first could help to warm you up and get you in the zone. If you're a programmer, why not write yourself a little program that does something fun in the space of 10 minutes? Short-term plasticity also suggests that once you've retrieved a piece of information, it'll be easier to retrieve it subsequently. This means that doing a last minute cram before an exam actually could be effective to help improve recall subsequently, perhaps in the queue for the exam hall. All this is something that the folks at Neurotrainer have been tapping into. Neurotrainer is a suite of virtual reality brain training tools used by athletes and others that need to be highly focused while performing complex tasks. The tool can offer improvements in visual processing, working memory, focus and more over time with repeated use. But what Noah Rowland and his team have found is that it could also be used as a tool for priming cognitive function in the short term. And we started meeting with customers and prospects and customers started coming in and telling us, yeah, so this was ball players. Um, what's your feedback? Well, our, our hitters love to use Neurotrainer before they go to batting practice. Our hitters Priming. like to use Neurotrainer before they, they, they hit the game. And that's when we had resisted priming. It was so funny. We're like, no, we're so focused on the long-term benefits. We can increase your decision-making yeah. speed and this and that. And then I, I mean, there's like this obvious epiphany that's it's like an octopus sitting on your face and you're trying to look around it, right? It's yeah. athletes and everybody else want to know, why should I do this today? Imagine a future where before flying a passenger plane, a pilot must first engage in a bit of brain training to prime themselves for action and improve their focus. How about a surgeon? The benefits here are clear. By using a tool like Neurotrainer for a brief spell prior to competition or training, an athlete could theoretically enjoy greater focus, reactions and performance. Moreover, this could even result in heightened plasticity and thereby greater learning. Andrew Huberman discusses a similar topic in his podcasts, suggesting that hand balancing and similar activities could increase the amounts of plasticity promoting agents in the brain, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The key here is that the activity be challenging and novel, such that a high error rate encourages focus and learning and puts the brain in a state that's malleable and ready for change. So there's a lot of emerging data around the importance of errors. 90 minutes, you know, you have a 90 yeah, minute window to go learn something because yeah. the thing isn't neurotrainer. The thing yeah. is take your Yeah, brain. that's like a pre-workout, I suppose. Right, you know? right. And, and that really, I, I think um, Jamie mentioned um, uh, Andrew Huberman's podcast, mm -hmm. and he said something very similar, doesn't he, about inversions and handstands and stuff, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. obviously not everyone wants to go doing handstands. So can we get somebody into a performance state in six minutes? Can we do it yeah. in four? Because we can do it, I mean, as you know, you, you, you're you a VR guy. We're hijacking your, your visual cortex. Yeah. That's another interesting point to consider. The baseline plasticity of your brain varies from person to person, which means priming could have a lesser or greater effect on you. If you're interested in discovering more about your own personal levels of plasticity, then I highly recommend the DNA analysis tool, Self Decode. Self Decode will analyze your DNA using a file you may already have from an ancestry service or similar, or a simple saliva sample. This will then reveal many genetic traits that may impact on your performance in highly detailed reports, and relevant to this discussion was the report regarding my own levels of BDNF. This could reflect my own levels of plasticity. There's a link in the description down below, and if you follow that, I'll get a small commission, so thanks in advance. Of course, there are other options if you want to shop around a bit first. Before parting ways, I should mention that priming can happen implicitly. You are constantly being primed by your environment and your actions, and this is what so often leads to the disconnect between the way you want to perform and the reality. Think carefully about your environment then. Pay just as much attention to what you put into your brain as you would your stomach and especially when it comes to the moments leading up to an important event. So hope you found this video useful and interesting guys. If you did, then please leave a like and share it around. That helps me out immensely. If you like this kind of discussion that looks at the interplay between physical and mental performance, then you'll definitely enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training. That's a unique training program and discussion in that it focuses not only on strength and aesthetics, but also on mobility, focus, cognitive performance, creativity, everything all at once. There's a discount on right now during the pandemic and there's a link in the description down below. Alternatively, I also discuss the brain and its relation to physical performance a lot in my print book, Functional Training and Beyond. If you want more like this, then please subscribe. And either way, thank you so much for watching this one, guys. I really appreciate it and I'll see you next time.
Bye for now.